Hello and welcome to Badgers Basketball Battlestar Galactica. This is Will Huth. As a reminder, if you're listening on Spotify, listening on YouTube, listening on Google Podcasts, if you can give a subscribe or like, whatever you want, super appreciate that. On to, on to hoops. Uh, Wisconsin has a disappointing, well, I guess their season hasn't ended yet, but a disappointing uh, transition, we'll call it, to their season, not making the NCAA tournament. If you've been following me on Twitter, I've been kind of more and more pessimistic, realistic, whatever you want to call it, kind of with those chances. Um, you know, it didn't make the first four out. It looked like we were in that next group of four. And I think that for now, that's all I'll say. We'll have some more specifics on like an end of season episode. Um, Cause we're not there yet. We got this game this week. We got some data to talk about and, and that could, that could just be a rabbit hole to, to get into. So, We'll do that later. Anyway, we did have a game last week, so we got to have a player choose dinner. And while there wasn't a ton of bright spots to look from for that last game, you, I, I was going hard between two players, but I, I went, I went with Jordan Davis. You know, Wisconsin showed up, I think, twenty five minutes late to that game, and there's one, one, one thing I give Jordan Davis credit credit for is that all year even when he went from a starter to uh to coming off the bench he has been you know had a you know don't have to get ready if you stay ready mindset and while that's had some shot selection that hasn't been great i think in, in general he's he's really helped us out a lot and he's one of the guys that helped kind of spark the the comeback that fell short against ohio state so credit to jordan davis speaking of ohio state you know, I, I'd rather not talk a ton about that game, not only because, you know, essentially it was the nail in the coffin that sealed our, our postseason fate, but also just because the first, as I said, 25 minutes were kind of a bummer. What I what I will say, though, is the last 15 or so minutes were fantastic. You know, the energy, the urgency, the affecting the game – mindset or actions that we the players had were awesome you know i think i, I mentioned in a in a, one of the podcasts last week or week before how i had a team where both me and the players kind of had to like you know see the difference between you know there's being in the right place and doing your assignment versus actively affecting the game and making a difference in the first 25 minutes or so we had a lot of guys that may are in the right spot and they did the right thing but they weren't they weren't actively you know, positively affecting, affecting the game for Wisconsin. And I had a conversation with a friend this week where I kind of made that point and he was like, Oh, it's inexcusable for a college team to do that. And like, and part, part of that's true. Yeah. It's also on a totally different level than, you know, any high school player would have had to go through, you know, this is, this, it sounds like a really easy thing to describe. And at the same time, you know, there's so much that these players got to go through with, game prep and you know going through film and making sure their own bodies and mindsets are right so like i said last 15 like that's that was the energy that was the that was that that was a, a team that could have won a few games this tournament maybe could have gotten us in the the SLA tournament but can't look on that too much the other thing i'll say for that game is that kind of hit me in reflecting on it is i think the roles that the players had on this team, the last 20 or so games versus the first 10 were such a stark difference. And maybe not the roles, maybe the lack of consistency in the execution and the, uh, let's call it kind of mindset or understanding of roles, I think was just such a stark difference. Like I thought those first, you know, we started 11 and two, so those first 13 games, I was seeing a team that knew exactly who to get the ball to, when to get it to them. They knew what the best shot was going to be. It was really fun to watch. And it was really kind of inspiring because a lot, I mean, but they, like I said, they got, what well, they got up to what 14th. And this is not a team people thought would be that good. We get a couple injuries. And also the big 10 is often said to be one of the best scouted leagues in the country, you know? So then we have other teams that are clearly ready and have a better game plan for us. And I think the 
the transition between the injuries and just being really well scouted was kind of rough for this team, which, you know, they had newcomers and young guys. It's just, that was something that kind of, I didn't really think much about, but it, it kind of clicked at least, at least from my perspective against Ohio state. And, and last thing I'll say, I think not having a true multifaceted threat on offense, which is another kind of thing this team had to deal with. The wrench this team had to kind of deal with that was kind of that went into their lack of success, I guess we can call it. Because they had a lot of really good players. Wall and Crowell, both really effective post players. You know, Wall was improved from three, Crowell dipped a bit, so they didn't really have that true inside out. Asijan, great shooter, came on with his two point scoring, but his main threat was a three point scorer. You know, I think Klesmit was kind of his three and D, got a little more aggressive as the season went on. It's just, I think there was, and then, and then Chuck, you know, really good shooter, maybe a little inconsistent with the, with his pull up game and some of those finishes near the hoop. So I think this, I think this, on the flip side, though, all those players, I think, can become more multifaceted in that there is more than one way they can beat you on the offensive end. I just, again, it's one of those things that kind of with that, with the roles that players have on a team that kind of, kind of clear it up for me, from my, it's my opinion, at least, to end the season. And I guess, like I said, we're not going to do like an end of season review, but there's one statistic I got to talk about kind of with the scene down the stretch, and that was their shooting. Okay. And I'll just say this right off the bat. I think this was a good shooting team. I think they had a lot of good shooters on this team. However, there were factors that when they came into play that really hurt this team down the stretch. Okay. And to be done, I think one is something we've mentioned a lot in the show. That's just, they had a thin bench, you know, the top five or so guys played a ton of minutes. And after that, it was, you know, not not very consistent and not uh, super reliant, you know, second win, so to speak. And even though we did have some good shooters, it was mostly just three guys. So it was very concentrated on Chucky, on Klesmet, and Asijan. And even though we had three good shooters, they all had some streakiness to their game, okay? And sometimes I think people paint – a player being a streaky shooter as just like the worst thing you can be. And honestly, sometimes it is frustrating at the end of the day though, like Chucky's still end of the season as a 40% plus three point shooter. That's fantastic. Um, and I'll get some other specifics here. So I think those three factors kind of led into this. Although I will say again, I do think overall the team was a good shooting team. And those three guys that listed are three very good shooters. Okay. However, if we start with the last seven games, so this would have been right after the Nebraska game. We had four road games, excuse me, four home games, two road games, and then one neutral game, obviously against Ohio State. As a team, we shot 47 for 153. That's just under 31%, which is not great. And there was a that's including that Purdue game where they did shoot 41%. So that's that means those other six games was a rough outing, to say the least. Uh, as I mentioned, Chucky, pretty sure I'm yeah, he ended the season still of 40%. He ended the season shooting six of 25. Connor season. If you ignore his three point attempts in Mich- against Michigan at Michigan, this is actually a little worse, but if you just look at his in regulation, three point attempts, he was nine of 39, which was around 23%. Okay. Right? So he's two best shooters, neither of which of which are at 30. Heck, then you're at 25%. Okay. If those two guys had shot 30%, right? Still not good for the for those two guys. Shot 30%, that's 12 more points that can be I mean, not spread out because that's be at least three points one game, three points another game. But that's 12 more points we score over the last seven games. Okay. And for what it's worth, those last seven games, we needed 15 more points to be distributed strategically in those last seven to win all seven. So this is just another example. I feel like a lot of times we over losses here and we look at some of these stats or some of these trends. It's like Wisconsin lost this game and all we need is a little bit of improvement here or here. And it's very minimal improvements. Like asking our two best three point shooters to shoot 30%, not a big ask. Okay. Again, 
I'm not saying they're not good three point shooters. Those two guys played a ton of minutes down the stretch. The entire Big Ten knew those guys were shooting the ball. So it's it's frustrating, but it's also I think a little sign for optimism because that's something you can build on for next year. <sighs> Let's see. Is that everything from that section? Yes, that's yes it is. And we'll go to more specifics specifics with some of those small but significant factors, probably at our end of season episode, but I had to bring that up because it was just shocking with some of those numbers. All right. Moving on, I mentioned a while ago how I've been collecting data about regular season versus postseason wins and kind of wondering about the question, is Wisconsin an underwhelming or underachieving team in the postseason? Let's take a look here. So what I did, and I wish this was like one place you could just find this list, but there wasn't. But I started with the 2001-2002 season. Maybe that seems arbitrary, but that's when Bo Ryan became head coach for Wisconsin. It kind of started this new era of Wisconsin basketball success. So and I shouldn't say new era. They've been building for about eight years before that, but he's the best coach in Wisconsin history. That's when he started. So we'll start there. And what I did is I, for every single team that's made the tournament since, two, excuse me, since the 2001, 2002 season, I compiled their regular season wins. That does not include their conference tournament wins, just regular season wins and their postseason wins. And the question became, based on the regular season wins, is there like, does Wisconsin over or underachieve based on their postseason wins? Now, as some of you probably are thinking to yourself right now, you might be saying, Will, there are so many more factors that go into it besides regular season wins. And you're right. The R squared value for this, whether it was linear or logarithmic, was not great. Wasn't expecting it to be. And what I would have liked to do is made make essentially like a three-dimensional dot plot. However, I was not able to find a software that could do that. That was at least free. So right now I have all that data that's just like ready to kind of further look into. However, with this other information I did find that I thought was very, very interesting. So what I was able to do is find the median amount of wins, the total amount of wins, the average amount of wins a team has in the postseason since 2001, 2002. And Wisconsin, I should also add the the organization I have on this, just seeing how Wisconsin for every single year but one, because it ended last year, it would be missing two points this year, but every single year but one, Wisconsin has an entry for this for this data. And that is so cool to see. Like there's schools like Duke is missing one. Kentucky's missing, I think, three. You know, only I think the only schools are missing none are Gonzaga, Michigan State, and Kansas. So I think people like to complain about Wisconsin way too much. It is it is cool to see that that consistency in a in a visual visual way with all this data. But anyway, so I was able to kind of like take a look at all that. And Wisconsin has the 10th most postseason wins since 2001, 2002. I will say that again, the 10th most postseason wins since 2001, 2002 with 31. Okay. I'm just looking through this. A lot of teams, one or two or three. So that's, and then the, the teams above them are just, you know, 32, 33. So they're right there. Now, some of you might be saying, yeah, well, we make it so often, so we just add up all these, you know, one game here, one game here, two games here. And to a point, you're kind of right, because Wisconsin was 23rd in average wins over that same time frame, which, I mean, obviously is a bit worse. However, there are some teams that have made the tournament only like once, twice, three times, and in one of those years, they make a little mini run to the Sweet 16, Elite 8, Final 4, whatever it is. And so their their average gets heavily skewed for that one season. You might be arguing, well, Wisconsin's are skewed because they made back-to-back -back Final Fours. But the original point, they have, I think, the third most or tied for third or fourth most entries in postseason play since 2001-2002. So that's, those, it's not going to be as skewed of all those entries. Um, so if we were to remove... Every team that doesn't even have 20 postseason wins. We'll do 19 because there's one team sitting at 19. 
if a team has to have 19 or more postseason wins instead of 23rd, if they were, what, they were 17th. So again, still not as good as 10th. But in general, Wisconsin is a top, well, well absolutely, Wisconsin is a top 25 team in their postseason play in terms of the average wins they get. And if you remove some outliers, I would argue, because of their very small, small appearances, they're like a top 20 team. Okay. In addition, I ignored it when teams didn't make the tournament. So for example, like when a team like Kentucky misses the tournament, they don't get a zero for their postseason play that year. They don't even get an entry for that year because they didn't make it. Okay. So the Wisconsin might even look even better if some teams got a zero for years they missed. So only a couple data points there, but it is an argument that might actually kind of say Wisconsin is actually pretty good in the postseason. The other thing data wise I did is I looked at the amount of wins each seed got since 2001, 2002. So essentially what I did is I looked at 2002 and I said, all right, how many seeds, how many wins did the one seed get in 2002? There were 13 wins by one seeds, 11 wins by two seeds, six from three seeds, so on and so forth. I did that for every single season from 2002 all the way to 2022. Okay. I found the median, the average, and the standard deviation for each one of those seed for, for each one of those seeds over that 20 year interval. So, real quick, this isn't Wisconsin specific, but some interesting things I found is that really those top two seeds right? The one and two seed. They have a good chance to get a handful of wins. And then the average drops significantly. And not only does the average drop, but the standard deviation increases once you go from two to three, four, five, which I think it might be is, I mean, better teams. They have an easier setup. You should expect that. I was not expecting to be that stark of a difference. That was, that was surprising to me. The other thing that was surprising is that the seven seed is more likely to have more wins than the six seed. They have a higher average and a higher median. They also have a higher standard deviation, but that was still a surprising, surprising statistic. You know, in fact, the eleven seed has an average not too far away than the six seed. So take that for for what you will with your postseason. Uh, tournament bracket decisions, okay? So anyway, so we have all that information. Then what we're able to do is say, okay, does Wisconsin underperform or overperform based on the seed they have? And there have been some seasons where they have slightly underperformed based on the seed. You know, in 2022, they were a three seed. They were probably, they were like, they should have won one more game based on the data for what an average, excuse me, average three seed would do. Um, let's see, there was another year. They, yeah, they were the four seed in 2010 or about a half came off where they should have been. They were a two seed in 2007. We're almost a game and a half. I don't know what they should have been. So I mean, there's, there's been seats here where they've kind of under, underperformed. However, if you just kind of take the sum of all those differences over the years, it's their score is a 5.11, 5.11 which means that over the course of 20 years, they have about five more wins than the average team with a similar seeding over those, over those years. So what I'm going to do is if, if you're listening, you're actually interested in this. I'm sorry if, if it's probably hard to envision this without seeing the numbers, I am going to tweet um, like a protected view of this data set. So you can kind of see what I did. And if you want to be like, well, your math is terrible. You should have done it this way. Like, you know, let me know. Um, but it's based on the numbers I have seen right now, Wisconsin is actually better in the postseason than an average team given their seed or their appearances in the tournament. So use that information how you wish. All right, moving on to more concrete things for, for this season. Uh, I tweeted out last week about a player that Wisconsin reached out to that had already entered the portal. And 
since that happened, there's been multiple other players that have entered the transfer portal. For those who don't know, today was actually the official day you can enter the portal. And last I checked, there was 180 names in the transfer portal. And so I kind of realized once it happened the second or third time, like if I look at a film of every single person Wisconsin even talks to, I'm going to talk about so many people that never even come to Wisconsin on a visit or, or that's all I really hear about the guys that we reached out to them. So if we have a situation where I know for a fact someone's coming in on a visit or that we offered a scholarship spot to someone in the portal, I will have a, a blurb on them. But until then, I think I'm just going to kind of keep in mind or keep an eye on who we're, we're talking to. Okay. And speaking of, Wisconsin might not be done recruiting in the class of 2023, even though we signed and welcomed our class officially. What was that back in September, October? I should know when signing is for basketball, but I might to do this. Um, there was a player, his name is Brady Dunlap, who Wisconsin did look at a little bit last summer during his AAU circuit, who eventually decided not to offer this player a scholarship. He committed to Notre Dame. Those of you that don't know, Notre Dame's head coach, Mike Bray, announced he'll be leaving Notre Dame at the conclusion of this season. Their season's over. And I don't know when this exactly happened, but this player, Brady Dunlap, requested to be released from his uh, national letter of intent because the coach that he committed to play for is no longer there. Notre Dame honored that, and Wisconsin was one of the teams to reach out. It's kind of like, talk to this kid to see where he's at, including a handful of other kids. Uh, I think it said... Seton Hall was a team that reached out. Villanova was a team that reached out. There's one more significant one that I can't recall. Um, But in any case, it's a little interesting because I would have thought Wisconsin might only focus on transfers in the portal, ideally older transfers in the portal that can kind of like are good to go, ready to play. Um, However, if this is a a guy that they're – Greg Gard and and the coaching staff really liked. And if he's available, I mean, if it's more talent, go get him, right? Um, I have not been able a chance to look at this guy's film as the news broke today. However, I can say he's a six foot seven wing, good athlete, good shooter. To my knowledge, not a kind of season level shooter, but you know, can can shoot it from distance. And his team did just win a state championship out in California. So he's he's playing at a high level. So I will keep folks updated on that all right last thing for today wisconsin has another game to play they are playing bradley tomorrow just real quick this is being recorded on tuesday evening march 13th um but yes they're playing bradley who won their conference's regular season tournament which should be the missouri valley conference if I recall, I'm going to look that up real quick just to be sure. Uh, yeah, Missouri Valley Conference. They're out of Peoria, Illinois, not too far away from where my my wife's family is from. And this is this is a solid team. They, I'll get to more specifics in a second here. But one, the first thing I did is I is I looked up how many games they've played this past regular season against tournament teams. They've played six. They were one and five in those six games. And that one win was against Drake who won their conference tournament and is the Missouri Valley rep this year in this late tournament. Wisconsin conversely played 18 teams and was eight and 10 against tournament teams. The, which is based on some statistics and some real quick film. I was with, I watched Bradley is a team that has a pretty good offensive skill set. You know, they shoot the ball. Well, you know, they make roughly the same amount of threes per game as Wisconsin, and they have a similar, a little bit better, but a similar shooting percentage compared to Wisconsin. Um, however, they have they have six guys that shoot above 34% and take at least or average at least two threes per game, which I was a little surprised at because you know their their pace of play is really similar to Wisconsin. They're both outside the top three hundred in pace of play. Um and to get that many guys open threes was, I guess at one point is impressive. So I, I got to give them, give them credit where credit's due. Um, but it is, it's really spread out. You know, they have one guy that will make more than two threes a game. And then the other five average between 0.8 at 1.5. So this is not something like Wisconsin where Chucky 
Max Klesmet and Connor Asijan are getting essentially all all of our threes. You know, they they're very much more uh, spread out. the The one player who is averaging two is a five point eight point guard. And the, some of the highlights I watched of his, he's he's a pretty good player. But I think that's that's the kind of matchup I'm I'm hoping Chucky will be able to to uh, I don't want to say shut down, but I'm, I'm I like Chucky in that matchup. Water break. One sec. All right. Um, again, I only watch some some film from a couple of games and not much. They <clears throat> excuse me. They did seem to play pretty aggressive on screens. It's called a hard hedge. Essentially, the the defender who is guarding the player setting a ball screen. When the b- player with the ball comes off it, they will kind of like step out and try to almost trap or kind of push out the the ball handler. So I'm curious how we'll respond with that because sometimes when teams get aggressive with us on screens, we kind of back off a bit. But I'm hoping we kind of play like those those last 50 minutes against Ohio State and just attack right off it because that. That was something I think our guards can do, especially Chucky Hepburn. Um, I didn't see them double the post very much, which I don't think they had to do much in conference because they have a pair of six nine forwards that are pretty aggressive. However, they'll be going up against Wall and Crowell. So I'm not sure what they're going to do, but didn't see it on film. And some of the film I did watch, they they're when they're on offense, they set a lot of screens. Okay, at one point it looked almost like a blocker mover offense, which Virginia used when they won their national title a couple of years ago. Uh, but our our defenders can't be relaxed, both when we're guarding the ball and when we're like helping our own closeouts. Like if we if we kind of start this game like we did against Ohio State, this this might not not be good because this this is a Bradley team that will make some mid range twos, be able to get into the lane and make some floaters, and so we can't afford to give them these nice comfortable looks. We got to be kind of in their grill every step of the way. You know, as I mentioned, they have really similar pace. Um, what was curious to me, though, is they have three more turnovers and one more made free throw per game. And that's with they get about eh, two more possessions a game. Um, even with that, though, like I said, those extra turnovers was was I was surprised they were able to have the shooting percentages they did. I mean, not percentages. They 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 do score points in Wisconsin. I guess I would have thought those three turnovers would have had more of a effect on that, but I guess not. The as I said, their their shooting percentage is pretty good. This tells me like this is gonna be a good finishing team. This is probably gonna be a team that's gonna, as like I said, make some mid range twos. They like they do have two talented post players that have some good footwork, and so our our paint defense again is gonna be a big factor in this one. Let's see. Oh, so as I mentioned, they, their top two scorers are these two skilled forwards. Not, maybe not strange, but uniquely, I guess. They are both from the Netherlands. Um, they're both listed at 6'9". One seems to be more of a kind of a, I don't want to say brute strength, but one's a little bit bigger, a little more muscular, and one's a little more athletic. So I'm assuming Kral will take the, the bigger one, and Wall will take the other. They, um, they kind of use that size to be a pretty good rebounding team. However, they won't have that size advantage here like I think they usually do in the Missouri Valley Conference. So I'm wondering if Wisconsin – because usually they get about four more rebounds per game than their opponents. But if Wisconsin, being the bigger team, if we could use our size to win the rebounding margin, which isn't something we've done much this year, I'm wondering if that's enough of a difference right there. You know, it's very rarely, if ever, that simple of a task, but I'm – I'm curious how significant that will be. So having said all that, kind of what am I looking for for this game? Well, one thing I just said, is going to be rebounding. If we can take a team that usually gets four more boards than their opponent each game, and if we can win that, that's that's going to be a big kind of, I don't want to say flip of the script, but that'll be a significant, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? A uh, significant difference that they're going to have to deal with. So I'm I'm hoping we can use our size advantage to win that rebounding, that rebounding count, and the the second thing is our paint defense. So I mentioned this team makes about the same amount of threes as we do, but their overall field goal percentage is about five percentage points higher. They're at 46 or about 41. So they 
I'm assuming they get a good amount of points in the paint and do a good job, you know, hitting some tough layups, hitting some tough shots, kind of all right around the rim. And now Wisconsin has done a pretty good job defending the three point line. You know, they we usually force seem to take fewer threes than they usually do. There have also been games where when we do that, we allow teams to get way too many nice looks inside. You know, so my question is, can we be a force on the inside as well? We've shown glimpses of really good paint defense, really good post defense. When we played Marquette the, the second half, that was part of the reason why we won that game. The first two Big Ten games against Maryland and Iowa, one of the main reasons we won those games. I would argue both second halves against Michigan were why we won and almost won that, that other game. Okay, so the question is, like, can they do both? Can they continue their good three-point defense but also – frustrate this team when they get near the rim i like i said they have two skilled post players and i'm not sure if we're going to double the post or deny the post or just let them go one-on-one but i would bet because they've had some success with it i would bet they try to deny the post to avoid giving them these open shooters this is what they did against michigan it's what they did at least the first time around against maryland and I'm I'm wondering if this will be a little more effective because we're not going up against Hunter Dickinson. We're not going up against Zach Eady, right? So if that is the case, our guards are going to have to be ready to quick help and recover as that post player, if they're busy denying, isn't going to always be able to help be ready for help defense, okay? And that's, that is something that I think they struggled a little bit against Minnesota. We'll see if they've kind of cleaned that up since then. So, in short, rebounding, paint, or inside defense. All right, that'll be it for tonight. As a quick heads up, you know, I said there's going to be like an end of season episode at some point, probably after the championship game of like the official end of season review. That'll consist of like a whole team and player by player kind of review, maybe like a postseason needs or wants wish list, both with the portal and player improvements. And just general things I would hope to uh, maybe see a slightly different from next year. Um, once the offseason does hit, I'll probably start doing episodes once a month, which will probably mostly focus on recruiting or portal news. Uh, really, really any information that I come across and uh, think might be worthwhile or entertaining. Okay. So with that, hope everyone has a good night. If you are not yet going to the game tomorrow against Bradley. There are still tickets available. They're only 20 bucks the cheapest. You can get in the second level, which are great seats. Let's make this uh, a loud one for, for the Badgers. Have a good night, everyone.